please welcome first of all Kate Cooper. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andy, and thank you for all for being here in this windowless room. I just felt that there's a pressure to entertain because there's not even a window for you to look out of. So as, as Andy said, I'm Kate Cooper. I'm Head of Research Policy and Standards at the Institute of Leadership and Management. And so what I'm going to sort of do first is to set the context for how we got or get to the collaborative bit of the learning. As an Institute of Leadership and Management, you'd guess that we'd have an expectation or we're able to state what we think great leadership is. And not only have we done this in terms of this model, where we see leadership as multidimensional, I think for many, for too long really, that leadership has been considered sort of a, a collection of personal attributes with charisma featuring, featuring strongly and a vision. So if you turn up with this charisma and a vision, you somehow compel, persuade, encourage people to come with you. But we're increasingly finding that that isn't enough. And there's something quite fatalistic or deterministic about it, and the idea that you've either got it or you haven't, bad luck, good luck. So leadership, of course, is more, you do need your vision, your plan, your idea of where you're heading, but it's also about delivering results. It's about achieving, it's about succeeding. And it's owning those results whether or not they're successful. And again, increasingly, the need to be able to work collaboratively is going up and up organisation agendas, and we're hearing so much more about people needing to be able to work not only across departments, but across organisations and within and beyond sectors. And so collaboration is, is far more than teamwork. So we have a position, as you'd expect, on all of these things. And we also use it as our content management system. So we organize everything to do with leadership and management around these five dimensions. And they're also the values of the Institute, which can often cause us a lot of humor, I can tell you, especially if you're accusing somebody of being not terribly collaborative. The one that we start with, which is all sort of like, the, when I was talking about a collection of personal attributes, is the need, and we hear so much about the need to be authentic, to have integrity, to be trustworthy. And that we, as I said, we use this as our content management system, it's how we organize our content. So within each of our dimensions, there are sub-dimension components, and authenticity has eight. And we say the first step to leadership learning is self-awareness and that's like the first place to start and in order to encourage people to think of themselves as leaders to think of themselves as people who are learning to be better leaders we say start with self-awareness and there is a package of resources available free on our website and we encourage anybody and everywhere is able to access that at no cost and I'll talk a bit more about what that involves so here we have, this, we have this big dimension of authenticity broken down into a smaller starting point of self-awareness. We also have, again, it's freely available because we are a charity and our mission is to inspire great leadership everywhere. So part of that is to really encourage people who don't think of themselves as leaders to have a go at some of the things that we have freely available that reminds people that you do leadership all the time. And it's not happening you know, in C-suites, in, in big offices. It happens socially, it happens in the family, it happens in sports. There's leadership going on all around you. And often people don't appreciate the fact that they're not getting paid for it doesn't mean that they're not leading. So you can do this online quiz and it tells you where you sort of stack up in terms of our five dimensions and which one currently appears to be the most important to you. So you can see that this person here who's done this, very big on achievement. This is a, just an online uh, quiz selection of statements that you either respond true or false to. It's no more sophisticated than that. But within each of, as I've said, with each of these five dimensions, there are these components. Every component, self-awareness is free, freely available, um, has a set of resources that go with it. 
So there's a quiz which you can either start with or finish with. There's no number of times. What we often find people like to do is prove to themselves that they know things they've learned informally. So if, so if you think, for example, self-awareness has got, the, we look at that important to know about your personality, about leadership styles, about unconscious bias. These are things that anybody who's been into self-development, personal development, would really be familiar with. So our encouragement is, well, just go and have a go, see if you meet our standard. You know, do you know enough? Have you done enough? Um, or if, you're not, if it's new and you've never heard of these things, we've got lots of things that are enable you to support that now if you meet our standard you get a emailed badge it's not quite digital is it but it does arrive in a digital sort of fashion um, and that, that says well done and encourages you to go on to do the next thing if you don't then you get some personalized feedback because you get feedback of, around what you don't get is a is a list of right and wrong what you get is these are the themes that you seem to get that, that you were weakest on. Well, again, again, we don't use that language. It's all about where you can develop, where you can improve, where you can have another go. The only, you can do these quizzes as many times as you like. The only barrier we put in the way is that we say wait 24 hours. You're not, you have to wait 24 hours. And that really is to encourage people to actually do the learning rather than just keep practicing the quiz. So you've done really well. And we've, you've got your self-awareness, you've met the standard, you've read all our resources, you've actually, even possible, have met, done and completed the scorecard, and this is then we, in the realms of a membership benefit. You've done all 49. So you are incredibly knowledgeable about all those aspects of leadership and management that we've identified as being really important. Now this is not really, this is there's some like, new features, the scorecards are quite good compared to others, I think the personalized feedback's really quite good, you're very confident with our content because it's endorsed by the Institute of Leadership and Management, but it's still e-learning, she says sadly. So that's a picture of a digital badge, because I thought you were quite excited about that. Um, the idea, I, I'm sorry, there is an irony about having a digital badge emailed to you so you can print it out. But um, maybe in your feedback you could say, we find this really ironic, and then I can feed that back to our digital team. So you, you're allowed, or we encourage you, and this is where we started to, to get beyond the e-learning. This is where we were realizing that this isn't terribly, this is great, and people are undoubtedly learning, and people do love doing quizzes, and it becomes quite compulsive. And we were getting people completing the 49 component scorecards in a weekend. And, but it's then, well, good, you know some stuff. But leadership, remember, and that's of course what we're trying to encourage, is relational. It's very, very difficult to lead. You can lead yourself and you can do a good job. But essentially it happens in organisations, however small, because people relate and identify and have to work together. And going back to what I was saying about collaboration, that's becoming more and more important. That we're able to work with people where we don't have that sort of... Um, hierarchical control. We have to work with influence. You know, we have to work because we're nice to work with. We have to be, we work with people because they know we deliver what we say. You know, the, the way we work is changing all the time. And so much of what happens in organisations is through conversation. So if you, if you aren't able to articulate what it is you want from a conversation or what it is you want from a colleague, then leadership's going to be quite elusive. So we thought, how can we build conversations then into this, what's essentially this e-learning experience? So we've set up the, the, we have the technology. So now when you've completed one of the dimensions, so going back to, remember I showed you authenticity that had our eight components, we encourage you to book a conversation and we use Zoom to do that. And we have a very complicated uh, booking system. But what you do is you book a 15-minute slot, and then you phone up, and you go, well, you go through Zoom. You work 
and explain to an institute assessor why you've chosen the true and false answer. Because a new scorecard is automatically generated for that conversation. And it will draw from all the eight components. And what we found with this, people just love telling you why they chose true or why they chose false. And then that very articulation of their thinking, it's improving their understanding of the choices that they make. So it's not about, it, of course, there is a, there's a the domain there's a, a, of leadership and management knowledge. I'm not disputing that for a moment. But the sense that you make of it and how useful it is where you work is often in how you talk about it. And, it, you know, depending whether you're on in, in an introvert or an extrovert, extroverts particularly like to say things and then the sense comes in the words. Whereas the introverts tend to be a bit more sensible and they think things and then, this, then the sense comes from the thinking. But conversation is, is important to both of those sets of people. So we decided that these conversations were really important and we'd give them a go. And the feedback that we're getting, we've been running them for going on for a year now, is, is fantastic. They're absolutely loving them. But then, of course, as I told you, we have those people who are doing the 49 components and somewhat addictively. Others have done the five conversations, so they'll have an authenticity conversation, a vision conversation, achievement ownership. And then they're saying, well, what next? And this is where I think we're getting into a really collaborative learning space. I've taken this diagram. Most of you here would, wouldn't be here if you hadn't heard of Jane Hart and her um, somewhat radical views, I feel, on uh, social learning. I can say this because I actually used to share an office with her, so she knows that we don't always agree. Um, but where she does recognise and has absolutely the vanguard of that is the power of the social, the informal, the finding yourself things to know. Uh, you can find out things yourself. But of course, as we all know, if you're competing, if you're competing with Google as the source of the place to find out, you have no real sense of how good what it is that you're getting from Google. And it's interesting to see that, you know, Don Taylor obviously is asking us to make sure anything we, any slides we put up, um, we've had a, a very strong message, that they've got to be attributed. If we're making claims or we're saying where we got stuff from, where did we get it? And of course, I would always have given Jane Hart credit for this anyway. But so that need to be able to val val validate, verify, find out your information is, is really important. So, of course, we're doing that for you as the Institute. But that making sense of it and making it work in organisations is the next stage of this whole process of bringing e-learning from a, a solitary pursuit into a collaborative pursuit. So we, my leadership, of being the trademark, as it were, for the e-learning um, resources we have, the my, we, we find very powerful. So we tend to use my a lot in front as a, a prefix. So what we did with my conversations, and this we've just started, is to build on those things I've been talking about, about the importance of relationships for leadership, that it's about dealing with people, that you can, own, you can learn some stuff from e-learning, undoubtedly. You can read things, you can watch things, and you can be better informed. And there's always going to be a place for that. But the next stage is how often have we you know, heard people say they love the face-to-face, the -face, they love the training room experience, even if actually people like Jane Hart are quite disparaging of it. And how often do you hear people say they love the coffee breaks? Because that's when you hear so much. So it's those conversations when people are making sense of the knowledge that they've just heard about or been reminded of or, you know, even heard for the first time, new way of thinking. That's when the, the real change starts to happen in, in people's thinking and how they ad adapt to their organisational role. But it's expensive, it's time-consuming, and 
as we just saw a couple of weeks ago with some research that was published, it would seem that disproportionately the better developed people in organisations, i.e. in terms of you know, level of educational attainment, are the ones that attract more development funding. So it's, it's also quite privileged, and anyone who works in training knows the moment things get difficult, we, we, you know, let's first, let us look straight away at the training budget. But we want learning that leads to this sustainable behavioral change, as I've said, and our, our belief is, in, in that talking about it, that really helps to consolidate it. So... We set up something called My Conversations, and what we used it for, for initially for the pilot, we are a membership body, a professional membership body, so we do have grades of membership. So you can go in, you know, as a, an associate, any of you in professional bodies will be familiar with this sort of structure, and then there's certain criteria and hoops, and then you pass up to the next level. Now, the highest level that we have is, is fellowship. So... And at the moment, our way of deciding whether somebody's worthy of fellowship is that their application goes to a panel. So what we were thinking was, well, fellows love to talk about leadership, they're experienced, they've obviously got a lot to offer each other. Why don't we use a conversation as a means of testing their fellowship capability? So that was, we gave people a reason to join a conversation. The conversation had to be meaningful. It had to be about leadership and management. There had to be a point in them taking part of it. And there had to be a sense of it was going beyond that, that e-learning experience. So at the moment, if you complete all your 49 components and meet the standard, that entitles you to the grade of membership. And they're able to use the letters after your name, member of the Institute of Leadership and Management. So, we knew that the content of what people were doing has a meaning for them in their jobs. The significance we wanted it to happen, in our case, in this instance, it was the fact that you got a fellowship from it. So this wasn't a conversation that did, it was a bit more than a, you know, a coffee bar conversation. It mattered to the individual that they did well in the conversation. So this is all about trying to say, this is important. This is something that you're talking about. Has, it matters. It matters to leadership and management. It matters to the people that you're talking to. And you are well informed. Because what you, I'm sure what you find, if people are on their, being with people who are trying to do something well, usually helps other people to raise their game. I don't know if anybody of you have, have heard of Peter Honey, Honey and Mumford Learning Styles. I mean, it goes back a long time, but he's a very, very big name in learning for quite a long time. And I can remember being in a seminar with him with some colleagues who usually never participated in anything. Put Peter Honey in the room and they all became brilliant. And it was the, the fact that they were trying to be their best because somebody else was there that they wanted to impress. So there will be that sort of factor. So everybody there wants to seem, wants to put, bring their best game, if you like. And in order to ensure that the conversations were meaningful, significant, and all the other things, they obviously had to have a very tight topic that people could get ready for. So going back to us saying, you know, the first step in leadership learning is self-awareness, what we did was, let me see. Ask people to challenge conventional thinking about leadership and management. So as I said, self-awareness, know your personality, understand leadership styles, be aware of unconscious bias. So the first topic for the first conversation was, well, why don't personality tests work? So the, not only did they have to sort of take their own position about personality tests and where they were, but they had to know the counter position as well. So when we, people were saying, well, what next? This to us is, is saying, yes, there is a, a knowledge basis and that is really useful for everybody. But when it actually comes to making a difference in the organization, to make you a better leader and manager, 
it, you, you can't just read off, you know, this is 10 top, 10 top tips to teamwork. I'll go in and do those on Monday. We all know the difficulties with learning transfer. And if you are a proponent of or a critic of personality tests, for example, isn't it useful to know the arguments from the other side? to be able to speak with authority and confidence about the position that you're taking with anything to do with leadership and management. So this, there's a challenge to these conversations. And of course, as I've said, it's the articulating your, your thoughts, it's putting them into words that help you make sense of what you think about things. Because the conversations we have in our heads with ourselves are not usually as helpful, always, as the ones that we have with other like-minded people who are as interested in the ideas that we're talking about. So what we're trying to replicate in these conversations in a cost-effective, accessible way, no geographical constraint, of course, was to replicate that coffee break experience. You've heard something you don't like about personality tests, you find somebody who's heard the same thing, read the same thing, watched the same webinar in this case, and you've, you want to tell them about your thoughts. You want to listen to what they think. And that's what we've been doing with these online conversations. How am I doing? Have I, have I got time for my task? So what I would really like you to do now in the, in the last five minutes is on your, can you get one, I know it's hard because who wants to be the volunteer, but I would like a sentence on one of the, the pads, that, a page that's available on each, to, what makes a great learning conversation? A conversation that you participate in where you feel, oh, I've learned something from being in that conversation. And that's quite different from reading something or being told something. So what makes a great learning conversation? And if you could get, you know, agree some sort of bullet points definition on each table, I'd be really grateful. Hello, I'm really sorry to say how important I think conversation is and then try and stop you when you're doing it. <laughs> um, there, there is an irony about that, and another irony for you today. Um, so by just, I'm go what I would like to do uh, is collect those, and Andy said he'd help me with that. And what I'll do is synthesize them then, and then I'll put them on, I'll publish them on our website as what, you know, what a great learning conversation is. But it's all right, they'll all be anonymous, unless you particularly want them attributed to you. And if you do, please put your name in big, Bold capital, so I'll know that you really want the shout out. Um, do um, connect with me on LinkedIn, that's one of my favourite things. But just by way of conclusion, this is an experiment we've been doing, and I think the three things that we've found that the, the learning from it has been incredible from all these conversations we've been having. Remember, these are all, nobody's in a room, these are all virtual conversations. We've not had anybody in the same room having them. People have to be clear why they're there. Now, we, were, we use fellowship in this instance, but you can link this to all sorts of other things. And of course, being part of a, a particular course, being part of a project, there's got to be a clear purpose. Why are you talking to all of these people? Because I think we all know if you just say, come together and have an aimless conversation, that is exactly what you get. They should have a significance, a profile. Um, and by that, I mean that people should know about them. These conversations are happening. They're going on and they matter. They mean something. And what that means can be quite slight. As I say, you can, you can link it to performance management. You can link it to some sort of... Because people love the status. And, it's the, and that feeling of being special. And they should have an outcome that matters. And now what I'm, we, we set a standard for these conversations. And if you, if you look at the slides, I've actually included what we, our expectations for the, the conversation. But that really, that's one way of doing it. Somebody being interested in what happened in your conversation, in what you learned, gives it significance. 
And for those of you who are coaches or ever being coached, that to me is the magic of coaching. It's because somebody cares what you think. Somebody is interested in your views and how you're seeing the world. So a conversation like this will work if somebody cares, if somebody's interested in what was, going, what was said and what was happening in it. And that really is the extent of the significance that you have to give it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to all your definitions. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, if you want to carry on that conversation, Kate will be available at the end of the session, or you can continue to use Twitter to, to collaborate and using T3S1, the hashtag for this um, particular session, um, where you might also meet the wonderful parody Don Taylor account. If uh, anybody's not seen that yet, find it. Right, next up, Gemma. Hi folks, um, I'm Gemma Critchley, for those of you who I haven't met before. I'm tempted to wander, but I don't have a mic on, so I'm going to try and stand here. Um, so I head up um, learning innovation and technology for Aviva, and that role basically means I make useful stuff to help people do their jobs. Um, a big part of what I do is I use uh, social learning to try and connect people and get people sharing ideas and just like Kate said, having really meaningful conversations. Um, so, oh, I've not got the clicker, I know I have, here we go. Um, in the spirit of collaboration, doesn't seem to be working, it's fine. Let's collaborate. <laughs> um, so I'm sure for the majority of us in the room, you hate this when someone stands there and goes, let's do this, let's do something. Um, but we're going to do it anyway. So this half of the room, so everyone from the second table's in, I want you to think about something that you're really good at. And this half of the room, which is sort of a third of the room, really, sorry, that's unfair, um, I want you to think about something you need help with. And that can be anything. You might be really great at yoga. You might be really great at making soup. Thank you. Um, you might be really great at um, being a good friend. You might need help with those things. It might be something at work. Um, and what I want you to do, if you're on this side of the room, after three, I want you to shout as loud as you can at that side of the room what you're really good at. And that side of the room, on the same count of three, I want you to shout what you can help with. Does that all make sense? Okay. If we all got something that we're good at or that we need help with? Cool. Okay? One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. Um, how, how did it feel to be um, on the receiving end of that and to be asked to do that? You're quiet, Neil. That's not like you. <laughs> um, anyone else? How did it feel? Did it feel weird? Yeah? Feel a bit forced? A little bit strange? A little bit, oh, I'm not really sure why we're doing this? Um, in my experience, um, working in learning for the last sort of seven or so years, that's what it feels like when we ask our people to collaborate or we ask our people to do something. We create this false environment where we're, we're asking them to to like and share and post and, and create and collaborate and, and join up and smash silos. And in reality, it just doesn't work. It makes people feel, feel awkward. It feels fast, it doesn't feel real. And I think where I've seen collaboration work really, really well is where we remove that forced element of it and we really make it about doing useful things and making useful connections for people. Um, so, Yay, I'm working now. <laughs> uh, so with that in mind, if we don't want to create that sort of forced environment um, and we know that that feels a bit awkward and a bit, a bit rubbish, doesn't really work for people, um, do we even need to collaborate? And that's a question I, I would always, always ask before we start to think about anything to do with technology, before we start to think about anything to do with 
um, how we're going to do it. Let's think about what the business objectives are that we, we really want to drive. And one of the things that I really don't want to do today in having the privilege of um, being on a stage, I didn't know I was going to be on a natural stage. This is uh, quite exciting. <laughs> but one of, one of the uh, things that I really don't want to do is I don't want to stand here and say this is how you should do it. What I want to do is share some real war stories around what I've done or tried to do or failed at and got wrong, the experiments that I've done and the things that I've learned from them. Um, and I think one of the m big mistakes that I made previously is assuming that because the organisation says we need to collaborate more, I then run away and my sort of inner doer and people pleaser for my sins goes, brilliant, I can find out how to do this and we can use Twitter and we can use LinkedIn and we can bring Yammer in and we can have Workplace by Facebook and actually none of that stuff is helpful. Um, for me, it's all around really understanding um, the challenges that our people face and then creating helpful stuff that addresses those challenges. So some of you in the room will have come across this before. There's a, a really handy model called Concern Task Resource. Um, it's developed by Nick Shackleton-Jones and I will tweet afterwards a link to his blog post where he explains it much more eloquently than I'm sure I will. Um, but what he does in that model is really neatly says, just spend time with the people that you're working with to understand what their challenges are. So ask them their concerns, ask them what they're worried about. And then ask them what they're trying to do. So find out what the tasks are that they're doing. And once you know what they're worried about and what they're trying to do, you can create resources. So you can create really helpful stuff that helps people to do the task and that addresses the concerns. So, for example, um, to give an example of using Yammer, so in a previous life, I was um, part of the learning innovation team at BP, which I was hugely proud to be part of. Woo -woo. Got some former colleagues in the, uh, in the audience. And um, one of the things that we did there is Yammer was, was launched as the official collaboration tool, as I'm sure has been in many of your organisations. And people came around with flags and stickers and post-its and events, and they said, go yam, go collaborate. And everybody sort of went, what? That, what's that for? We don't really get that. Um, and it was because they hadn't really sort of looked at what the need was. And so what we did is we said, right, okay, we're going to give this a go. We're going to try and address a, a real challenge that we've got in the organisation. And we were running a session, um, uh, sorry, a series of sessions called uh, Learning Live, which I'm sure is copyright LPI, but <laughs> um, we, we ran a series of WebExes um, that ran over um, a week, and that was global, so there were people in America doing it, people in the UK, people in other countries. And what we said when we started to plan that project is we're not going to have a single meeting, a single phone call, a single email about this. We're going to do everything through Yammer, and we're going to use that to collaborate on documents, we're going to use it to ask each other questions, we're going to use it to figure out who's doing what. And because it had a real purpose and it addressed a real challenge that we were doing, it actually worked. Now, I'm not going to say I'm advocating for Yammer in any way, shape or form. There are loads of great tech out there. But because we used it to address a real challenge and a real concern that we had, it really seemed to work for us. Um, so I'd say first, first thing that I found really useful is just to spend time understanding a challenge and then working out if you need to collaborate to, um, to address that. So let's assume that we've worked out what challenge our, our audience or our people face. Um, then what do we do? How do we work out what we're going to do to address that challenge? And this might seem odd, being at Learning Tech, um, but technology is not always the answer. Um, so some of the, the best sort of collaboration moments that I've had have been face to face. Just now I was chatting to Hannah and Babs at the front and just sparking loads of ideas and it was just a conversation. And I think as learning professionals what it's easy to do is to go to tech as an answer. I think what's harder is to look at actually is a conversation going to help to your point earlier Kate about those really meaningful conversations. Um, one of the things that I did recently, and there may be a few people in the room who've been involved in this, there's a, an amazing organisation called Clear Lessons Foundation, I don't know if you've come across it, um, sort of affiliated with Charity Learning Consortium, and um, 
what they do is they create leadership development content um, with organisations and they give it to charities for free to help them to learn and to develop. Um, and they're working on a new series at the moment called um, Digital Lessons. And the, the idea behind that is you get organisations together to share what they're doing, what they're in terms of developing digital skills and capabilities. And um, the way that we collaborated about that is we, we started with a Slack channel, um, didn't work. We then moved on, um, I think we did some emails, didn't work. Then we did some WhatsApp, didn't work. And then um, we got together, um, and for those of you who know Community Mike on Twitter, he really kindly hosted us at River Island, and we all went over to his office, and we just sat down in a room, and we hashed it out in a couple of hours. And that, for me, is still collaboration, getting people together, knowing how to get the right people in the room, understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, that was really powerful for me. And shout out to Clear Lessons, if anyone does want to get involved in that project have a chat with me afterwards. We're always looking for more collaborators. Um, so technology might not always be the answer, but sometimes it is going to be. Sometimes we're going to say, yeah, actually, a WhatsApp group's really going to help those people, or Workplace by Facebook is going to help those people. Um, and if we, if we do choose to use a tech solution, I'll give you an example of, of what we did at Aviva quite recently. Um, how do we make that work? So we look for the bright spots. So we, another way I've heard this articulated is go where the energy is, which I quite like. Just recently got into yoga, so I'm all about the, the flow at the minute. Um, and we look for where people are doing collaboration well already. Now, the surprising thing about this for me came out of a conversation with, um, with a colleague of Eva. And I was racking my brains around, OK, we've got this leadership development program that we're running, and we want our leaders to collaborate globally and to come together and share ideas and work on stuff together. So um, the program that we run, as part of it, we ask our leaders to run what we call a simplicity experiment. And this experiment is um, something that runs over 12 weeks, and they pick a problem, and then they go away and they solve a problem in groups of like six or seven. And how they do that is up to them. They can choose to do it. Um, via getting together, they can choose to do it by Skype, they can choose to do it by WhatsApp, we, we don't dictate that. But what we um, did see, which I thought was really, really interesting, um, and you probably need a bit of context before I sort of go on to the example. So the context is, as a business, Aviva is a Microsoft business, so we have Microsoft Office 365, which I'm sure many of you in the room also do. Um, we don't currently have access to the Teams or the Yammer part of that, but that is coming this year. Um, but what we saw, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, um, a group of people in Aviva went direct to Facebook Workplace. Um, so for those of you who haven't come across it, it's, it's the business version of Facebook, so all the functionality is exactly the same, but it's just for your organisation. Um, people went there and they signed up and they, they basically made it happen. Um, they set up their own groups, they used it to share videos, they were recording lives through it. Um, and it were, for me, that was really quite amazing that people had gone and done that off their own back. Now, I'm going to take aside all conversations about IT and procurement and all of that, because obviously working with big organisations, we have to consider things like data security and um, IT, and we have to navigate that landscape, which is really important. But I think just from a grassroots level that people had reached out and they'd said, we want to go on this, um, I think was really, really powerful. The other thing that really surprised me is um, where the most conversation happening wasn't anything to do with the leadership stuff. Well, actually, it might not be that surprising to <laughs> some of you. Um, where the most conversation was happening was like in the, in the Fantasy Football League group or in the Pets of Aviva group, and I know at BP on Yammer we had Pets of BP was the, the most active group from the entire um, BP global group. Um, but the idea is, if you see that sort of activity happening in your organisations, lean into it, don't try and block it, don't try and walk away from it, just embrace it and go over to the people who are arranging like the bait contest 
and they've got this fire WhatsApp group that's got 50,000 people in it, go speak to them and find out what they're doing and then use that to bring into your practice. Like, go where that energy is. And I think this is a drum that many, many people in this room will be banging and I think it's absolutely the right thing to do and I feel like it would be remiss of me to not call it out at an event like Learning Technologies is that we should not be solution driven. We shouldn't be thinking tech first. I think if we come to... I said I wasn't going to say what we should and shouldn't do and I, I totally am doing that. <laughs> but it is something that I feel really, really passionate about. I think, for me... Um, it's all about understanding, deeply understanding what that problem is that we're facing into and then choosing the tech. And one of the biggest pains that I have in my job today is that I end up in those conversations where people say, but we're a Microsoft business and we have this platform and we need to use it. Or um, from a, an LMS perspective, some of you will be using Cornerstone. It's, that's the LMS we use in Aviva and it serves as it serves as well for some parts of our learning that we do. Um, we've experimented with the Connect functionality on there as well, but I think to be wedded to something just because it's there in your organisation is the wrong approach. I think what we need to be doing is, again, going back to that concern task resource model, just really understanding what, what's working and what's not working for our people, and then letting the problem drive that tech solution. favourite slide of the day and it's only like 12, oh, it's after 12 now, I think we can talk about champagne um, <laughs> um, this for me is like one of my favourite phrases so I used to work with um, a tech development company and they used to say eat your own dog food which I thought was gross, I was like oh that's, that's horrible and then I heard someone else reframe it as drink your own champagne and basically all that means is um, we can't be asking people to do stuff that we're, that we're not immersed in ourselves. I think if we are saying we're going to start using social learning or collaboration, um, for me it feels really inauthentic for me to go out to the leadership population at Aviva and say, do this, if we're not role modelling that behaviour. So I think it starts from a grassroots place. I think it starts with us using technology that we understand and that we're passionate about and that is working for us and then seeing if that will work for other people but also being willing for that to not work and to fail fast and one of the things my team talks a lot about is how you create that safe space to fail and that safe environment to fail and I think only by doing this, by drinking our own champagne and um, trying things and getting them wrong, I think that's the only way that we can we can actually make it work for us. Um, I mentioned Cornstone Connect previously. We, we ran some experiments with it when I very first got to Aviva because I was sat in that discussion that was, this is a platform that we have and this is what we must use. Um, we ran some experiments and they didn't particularly work for us. And now I'm not saying that's anything to do with the platform at all. Um, I think it was the approach. We didn't really understand the challenge that people were facing. And actually... Um, the solution that really worked for us, and this was all around coaching. So, uh, Aviva, we've recently built our own internal coaching faculty, and um, it's about 150 people so far worldwide. And we were looking for a way to connect the coaches for them to share things that, that were and weren't working for them. Um, and whilst we were sat in a room, getting in a, a bit of a getting our knickers in a twist around what we should and shouldn't be doing. The coaches had solved it already. They were, they were off and they'd created a WhatsApp group and that was working brilliantly for them. And they didn't need a learning intervention or a learning technology. It was about using that consumer-grade tech. So going where people are and, and spending the time there. And that worked really well for them. Um, so I'm, I'm talking a lot about how... It's not about us pushing stuff onto people and it's about co-creating experiences that work for our people and designing those with and for the people that we're working with. Um, so I guess it might lead some of us to think, especially with some of the conversation that was happening in the keynote and I think some of the other sessions today, if all of that's changing and shifting, what's our job? Like, why are we here? as L&D professionals in that, in that social learning piece. If people are off setting their own WhatsApp groups up and setting their own Facebook groups up, what are we here to do? Good news is, it's not over yet. 
we still have jobs. <laughs> but I think our, our role is really, really changing. So we're no longer um, we're no longer pushing content onto people. It's no longer about um, an organisational content dump. It's about creating really useful stuff and curating really useful stuff as well that people will use. Um, so we do a lot of this in Aviva, curation. I think this is what we are now as L&D professionals, especially in a collaboration and social learning perspective. Um, from a curation perspective, we um, absolutely have a duty, I think, to be on the top of our game about what's out there and what's going to help people. Um, and also understanding where people are spending their time and where they're getting their insight and their inspiration. Um, I remember I threw the question out to my team when I very first joined a couple of years ago, and I said, where do you get your inspo from? And some of them said, like, they went off on fire. They had, like, a thousand different sources, and they were sending me links and everything. Some of them said, I don't. I just don't know where to start. And I think that's a really hard thing for someone to say, that they, they don't know where to start sort of when they're faced with this wealth of stuff that's out there. And I think our job is to make sense of that. So we're sense makers, we're curators, we're bringing in the best of stuff that's gonna help people to get stuff done. Um, I had a really interesting conversation last week. Um, I was away with my team doing some development and we were lucky enough to go to Brighton for the week, which was lovely. And um, one of the conversations that we got into there is about a new, um, a new thing we're developing. So we're, we're working on a single source of truth for our leadership content in Aviva that will help people to share and, and get into conversations around it, and it just helps to make sense of it. And uh, one of the guys in my team, a chap called Paul O'Hara, who inspires me every day, he, um, he said to me, um, how is this better than Google? And I think that's the question we need to ask ourselves. If what we're creating can be easily Googled, why are we doing it? I think the real value comes is in when we're sense-making, that stuff that you can find out there, and we're bringing it in in a relevant, timely way. Um, I think we also have a role to play as connectors. Um, so it's all about fostering connections, creating connections, role-modelling behaviour, um, engaging people to, to be those role models. And I don't just mean senior leadership either. I mean, looking at, going back to the Bright Spots piece, looking at where the passion is in the organisation for connection and really tapping into that. Um, so yes, great, if you can get your chief exec tweeting or get your chief exec on Yammer or Facebook Workplace, brilliant. If, um, if you can't, go where people are doing it. There'll be influencers in your organisation who have power way beyond the chief exec. Um, through that level of influence that they've built up on social media. Um, I think we need to be collaborators, so we need to be doing it ourselves. So uh, again, back to the drink your own champagne part, we, we need to absolutely be out there um, testing stuff, trying it, failing, not being afraid to fail as well. And for, for my organisation, for Viva, that's quite like a big mindset shift to be in a place where actually we say we're going to try this and we're going to invest a bit of money and a bit of time and it might not work. That's quite a hard journey to bring people on but I think that's something that it is absolutely our, our role to do and when I'm lucky enough to work for a boss who really believes in it and she does create a really safe space to, uh, to experiment and try stuff and fail and learn. Um, but with that, if, if you can't do that, if you haven't got 20 grand to go and throw it away in six weeks to try something. Start small, just do stuff that you could do today, like introduce using a hashtag and, and using Twitter to share some stuff that's not confidential. Um, set up a WhatsApp group with, with a group of learners to get them to collaborate and share ideas. Um, crowdsource, and I know Nigel's doing a session, Nigel Payne, later on crowdsourcing solutions, but um, use what you have and one of, one of the principles I'm reading a book at the minute called Designing Your Life and I can't remember who it's by sorry I will tweet it afterwards um, two wonderful professors from Stanford but um, they talk about starting where you are so not being frustrated that you don't have everything that you need and just starting where you are today so look at what you have got that is in your life your grasp your control and run some small experiments get some data out of them and start proving what is and isn't working and then make the case to do something bigger. Five minutes, thank you. 
Um, and finally, I think we're catalysts. So we've got to be brave, and we've got to be pioneers. The amount of times I go into rooms in Aviva and um, I bring the energy and I bring the passion, and I, I bring the data and the hard evidence and it falls flat. And there will always be a reason to not do stuff. And one of the conversations we were having earlier, just before the session started, was around culture and around how collaboration sometimes works better in some, um, some organisations than others, and that's all down to culture. And I think, for me, um, what I've seen is that Aviva is a, is a company made up of tonnes of different companies. The oldest company that we are made up of has been around for 312 years. Um, so we have legacy, we have silos, we have global issues to tackle, but it is doable, we can do it, and I think what we have to do is we have to keep having the conversation and normalising it and socialising it um, and getting out there and speaking to people who can influence in the organisation because it feels scary and it feels different, and it is. Um, but without trying it, we're never going to know if it works or not. Um, and so in the spirit of that, I would, I would encourage us all to just try it out tomorrow. Um, and collaboration may be nothing different than going into a, a team that you don't know and spending time in their team meeting to see if you get a fresh lens on a problem that you've got. It might be Skyping someone who... Um, and asking them if they can help you work through something. It might be spending time with your people in your organisation and really understanding what challenges they have. Um, and that doesn't need to be anything more sophisticated than a conversation where you just say, what's your problem? <laughs> uh, for want of a better phrase, it's sort of, what, what's up? Um, and then work out how you can help solve that for them. Um, but there are tons of things that we can do today for free together. Um, and we can share it with each other as well. I think one of my biggest sort of spaces that I get my inspiration, so places that I get my inspiration and my learning from, is my personal network. And that is made up of loads of people who are in this room and the other rooms here today and beyond. Um, and Twitter is a great place for that. So I think I would encourage you, if you've never done it before, go have a look on the hashtag um, lurk. You don't have to contribute to the conversation. I think listening is just a, as big a part of a as big a part of collaboration as talking is. Um, but I would just say, get started and don't be scared to fail. We're all trying it and we're all getting it wrong. Um, we wouldn't be having conferences like this if we'd all nailed it and there was a formula. So I would say, try it out. Um, nurture it. So don't get um, don't get too frustrated. Um, if it doesn't work straight away. There's a really great um, statistic around Google Plus and Twitter. I don't know, does anyone remember Google Plus? Is it still a thing? <laughs> um, so ap apparently um, Google Plus reached critical mass of the numbers it wanted to hit, say, I don't know, call it a billion users, within, I think, two weeks of launching. Because they had a massive, massive drive behind it. They had Google, one of the biggest corporations in the world, chucking all of their advertising behind it. Um, and it reached critical mass within two weeks. It took Twitter three years to get to the same point, but Google Plus is now nowhere to be seen, and Twitter is in the billions of users and is one of the main sources of collaboration and sharing and networking and news today. Um, so don't be disheartened if what you do doesn't work straight away. It's not going to. We'll learn. Um, but I think the important thing is to keep checking back on the data, keep looking at what's happening, keep talking to people and understanding what is and isn't working, and then, um, and then do more of the stuff that is and less of the stuff that isn't. And yeah, I would just say, let's begin, let's get started now. Um, so if you do have any questions afterwards, come grab me or um, tweet uh, hashtag T3S1. Um, that's my Twitter handle there. I am super open to any conversations, questions, and challenges. Like, please tell me if you're doing stuff that works well in your organisations, and please tell me if any of this didn't make sense, and then hopefully next time I share it, it might make more sense. But thank you so much for, for your time. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Two really good, interesting sessions. Um, I'm going to give you an additional challenge. I've just made this up now. Add a hashtag bridge to the session um, uh, hashtag 
and tweet out what it is you are going to take from these sessions to use back in your workplace. Um, and I'd like to hear a few now if we've got any time as well. I mean, I'll share a couple that I've got, obviously. First of all, I'm going to be hitting your website with that free stuff. Um, and I'm sharing that with the people who are working on leadership development where we are, because uh, I, I suspect there's some very useful thinking in there. Um, and I'll also be checking out, once again, Mick Shackleton Jones's blog, which I've not done for a while. Um, what sort of things have people here today suddenly thought, this is what I'm going to take back with me now? Have we got any, um, any obvious ones from the floor? Or are you going to assimilate those th that thinking over a neat, decent glass of claret tonight? Yeah. Um, so yeah, something that sprung to mind when Kate was speaking that, that I thought really resonated with me uh, in terms of the conversations is having that platform and that ability to verbalise your feelings and your priorities in a way that then can really help you communicate it effectively internally within your business. Um, so that was just something that, that I thought was really interesting. I think for me, the language of collaboration is something that we should avoid using and ask people what collaboration means to them. So it would add some value to them rather than it being a buzzword that we use and just throw around. Thank you. I think you're absolutely right on that. And that whole point about following the energy. Um, people collaborate in different places. If you're a salesman, you live in Salesforce. So you use Salesforce chatter. Any other sort of views, Or are you all waiting for that? Fabulous. Well, in that case, put your hands together for two fabulous speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's not lunch next anyway, so sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> and could you leave on the table the, um, the, 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 the learning uh, points that um, we want to collect together? Thank you very much indeed.